This lecture is on Paul, the law, and the gift of grace. There are six parts to this lecture. Parts one and two are here. We'll be looking at the new perspective on Paul and some responses, and then Jewish works righteousness. The outline for this lecture is as follows. Firstly, we'll look at the new perspective on Paul and some responses. Now, there's been a separate lecture on the new perspective on Paul, so only a little will be said about that here. The focus in this first section will be on some of the responses. Then we'll look at Jewish works righteousness, the question that's raised from the new perspective. We'll look at law and grace alternatives. And then, fourthly, works of law in first century Christianity, that is, in the New Testament. And then, fifthly, we'll look at works of law in Paul. And then we'll conclude in a summary format uh, to uh, consider the economy of works of law and the economy of divine grace. So first, the new perspective on Paul and some responses. The new perspective included a and started with a new perspective on Judaism that was argued by E.P. Sanders. Uh, prior to him, uh, there was an idea in some authors that Judaism was a, and is a religion of grace, not to be understood as a religion of law and a precursor to works righteousness in the semi-Pelagian form of Roman Catholicism that the reformers responded to in the 16th century. So some authors, beginning at the, the early 20th century, uh, argued that Judaism was actually a religion of grace. Montefiore, Moore, Enslin, Andrews, Parks, Sheps, and then famously E.P. Sanders in 1977 with Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Also, uh, argued Christer Stendhal, Paul was not struggling with his introspective consciousness before the law, like Martin Luther, struggling with how he could possibly appear before a holy God when in fact he was aware of his own personal sins. Rather, uh, the argument has to be something other than an introspective consciousness, argued Stendhal. It wasn't that Paul felt that the law was inadequate and was searching for something else. Stendhal went so far as to say Paul didn't undergo a conversion from Judaism, but rather a calling uh, when he was met by the risen Christ on the Damascus Road. Also, we have the idea that Paul is addressing certain laws, not the law in general. And most famously, as Dunn argued and others as well, the covenant identity badges of Judaism were what Paul had in focus. These had to do with circumcision, food laws, and special days. And Paul is concerned about the Gentile mission if such laws are to be maintained in the church. Furthermore, the New Perspective took the view that Paul actually doesn't represent uh, true Judaism. Heike Riesenon made that argument in particular. Or uh, the idea that Paul is arguing against Judaism from a Christian perspective, not arguing against what Judaism actually was, as E.P. Sanders earlier had said. He said that for Paul, the problem with the law was simply that it was not Christ. And one of his key verses for that is Galatians 2.21. And then, finally, Paul ignores the covenant grounding of ethics in the law, argued Sanders. And Sanders spoke of a covenantal gnomism, which we can look at now. Covenantal gnomism is, put simply, in terms of a pattern of religion, as Sanders argued, following an earlier scholar. And the pattern of religion that he suggests for Judaism was that you get in 
by grace and you stay in by grace and law. You might say that the liberal Presbyterian E.P. Sanders discovered in Judaism that the Jews were actually liberal Presbyterians. The f pattern of religion is how do you get in and how do you stay in the religion? And he found grace all the way through in a good Presbyterian way. The law plays a part, but the law is itself an aspect of grace. The law, for example, around sacrifices to remain in the covenant of grace. Well, that all raised the question, what about this works of the law language in Paul and its contrast with grace? Now, James Dunn, a major proponent of a new perspective on Paul, said in his commentary on Romans that works of the law refers to Jewish identity markers, to covenant badges that mark the Jews off as God's covenant people. And Paul, writing to a mixed church of Jews and Gentiles who had become Christians, wanted to address their uh, community, their fellowship with one another. And these covenant badges of the Jews were bringing about a separation in the church from the Gentiles. Those covenant badges were the Jewish food laws, circumcision laws, the circumcision law, and uh, Jewish religious days, Sabbath festival days. Paul gets to discuss this in particular in Romans 14. Now, in his new perspective on Paul, written in 2005, Dunn broadens, or we might rather say corrects, his earlier view. His earlier view that was that works of law refers only to those covenant badges. And he expanded that in 2005 to say, well, actually, it's a bit more. And it has to do with conduct prescribed by the Torah. Paul insists that justification is only through faith in Jesus Christ. This claim can be tested in certain contexts, which is why specific works, those covenant badges, were in view in Galatians. In fact, all social exclusivism, for example, racism, opposes new creation and the gospel of grace alone, says Dunn on page 35. The language of racism is a bit tricky for the first century. We tend to think of racism in terms of colors of people very often in our day and age. And that would not have been the case in the first century AD. It would have had to do with ethnicities even different Greek speaking groups distinguished from one another. Now, some responses might be mentioned to this brief introduction around the new perspective. And again, another lecture has been offered at much greater length about the new perspective. Uh, P.T. O'Brien focused on self-righteousness as the problem. In Philippians 3.9, Paul rejects the attitude of self-righteousness and approves a relational righteousness, right relation with God. Zeal for the law, which is good, can become self-righteousness. Moises Silva argued that the problem was about the source of righteousness. He notes that a righteousness from God is not only opposed to a prideful attitude, but also to a righteousness from the law. And Doug Moo focused on a personal and legalistic uh, issue with the law. He says that works of the law does not equal boundary markers, as Dunn had first argued, but a personal legalistic attempt of Jews at righteousness. So, although for many, E.P. Sanders' 
had put the nail in the coffin for understanding first century Judaism as having anything to do with works righteousness, some scholars continued to persist and say that actually there was such a perspective in Judaism. Tom Schreiner focused on moral failure as the issue. Against Dunn, he says that works of law are moral claims of the law, not just covenant badges. He suggested reading Romans 3.20, which talked about the failure to be justified by works of the law, in light of Romans 2.17 through 29, where Paul goes through various moral failures of the Jews, failures to obey the law, uh, even though they were circumcised. So the issue was not the issue of, say, circumcision, but the moral failure of the Jews. Schreiner says that there are three reasons that Paul denies righteousness by works of law. Firstly, it is impossible. The impossibility of obeying the law perfectly was the major problem. Secondly, any attempt to obey the law to gain righteousness is legalistic and antithetical to the principle of faith. This is different from Rudolf Bultmann. This is because of the impossibility of obeying, not because of the attitude of self-reliance that Bultmann pointed to. And then thirdly, Schreiner suggests something that sounds a bit dispensational to me, he says that there's a salvation historical shift that has taken place. Uh, it's taken effect by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I would say, well, Paul sees salvation history as fulfillment, not as a shift to something else. Now, Jay Lambrecht has uh, an interesting discussion which brings out several points. Uh, with respect to Galatians 3, 10 to 14. He says, first of all, that the language of works of the law uh, has to do with the problem of sin and the law. Works of the law fail because all, both Jews and Gentiles, have sinned. And also, over against done again, all the laws in view works of the law refers to all the law. He says, well, that's probably the case in Galatians, but certainly in Romans. He says in Romans 4, 2 through 6, and Romans 9, 10 through 13, the language of works on its own is more general than works of the law in Romans 4, 2 through 6. So there is the question of whether works of the law does refer to something specific uh, within all the Torah in Lambrecht's work, but nevertheless he links the two. And that's something that Dunn came to say in his 2005 work as well, that uh, it, there is a problem more generally, not just specifically with certain works of the law. Uh, I would suggest that the two phrases are the same speaking of works and speaking of works of the law refer to the same thing, and they refer to doing the law. Anyway, thirdly, Lambrecht says that there's also an issue of striving versus gift. Romans 9, 30 through 10, 4, and Philippians 3, 4 through 9, uh, contribute to understanding this distinction. The idea of someone's own righteousness and of a zealousness for righteousness uh, is pointing towards these works, and this does not lead to salvation. Only Christ leads to salvation. God's free gift precedes all human striving. Romans 9, 10 through 13 has in view Jacob's election being a gift from God. This goes beyond the law, and it has to do with something other than all humans striving to attain uh, salvation. 
Lambrecht also talks about a contrast between doing the law and fulfilling the law. I'll talk later about doing the law in Paul. Here, we ask the question with Lambrecht, does without works of the law mean Christians are beyond the law's requirements? Does without works of the law mean Christians are beyond the law's requirements? Now, Tom Schreiner had earlier discussed this in 1989. Uh, he looked at these nationalistic cultic observances and how they no longer pertain to the Christian church of the first century. And this is something that Paul is discussing in Galatians and Romans. He says these nationalistic cultic observances, these covenant badges, as it were, are abolished because the Mosaic law in relationship to the Mosaic covenant is no longer in effect. Well, we have to ask what that means. What does it mean for the Mosaic covenant no longer to be in effect? Paul's paranetic, that is his moral exhortations to the churches, shows that he actually does use the moral law. The moral law continues to be relevant in the churches, in Paul's writings, the moral law from the law of Moses. Now Lambrecht notes that Christians do not do, but they fulfill the law. And in this way, he tries to explain why it is that the law continues to be relevant in terms of its moral laws to the early Christian church and to us today in Paul's writings. Christ and the Spirit are the source of the Christian life, not the doing of the law. And then the re relevance for today is that salvation by faith in Jesus Christ is the way for everyone today not uh, one path of law and one path of faith. And also that for everyone and for the Jew as much as for the Gentile, grace is prior to any doing of the law, to any uh, moral uh, obligations. Grace comes first. And thirdly, grace works all the way through the believer's life. And Christians must through the Spirit act in love, and so fulfill the law. In an article in 1991, R.B. Sloan pointed out some important ways in which Dunn's view can't explain notions of law in Paul. Paul says that the law enslaves, the law produces death and kills, the law works wrath, the law increases sin, and the law is something from which one in Christ can be liberated. The language of liberation, freedom, is used. And all of these points are important because they make no sense if we're talking about works of the law as circumcision, food laws, and special Jewish holidays. It makes sense if we understand the law as something much larger than that. And so this seems to me to be a rather critical argument for uh, that earlier view that was endorsed by others like N.T. Wright, but that earlier view of um, James Dunn of Works of the Law's Covenant Badges. So now let's look at whether there was such a thing as works righteousness in Judaism in the first century. The New Perspective put out several arguments. So firstly, that there was no works righteousness in Judaism. Uh, that's three quarters of the book by E.P. Sanders, Paul and Palestinian Judaism. In the New Perspective on Paul, James Dunn quotes from the community scroll uh, that was found in Qumran. 1QS 11 says this, As for me, if I stumble, the mercies of God shall be my eternal salvation. If I stagger because of the sin of my flesh, my justification shall be 
by the righteousness of God, which endures forever. He will draw me near by his grace, and by his mercy will he bring my justification. He will judge me in the righteousness of his truth, and in the greatness of his goodness he will pardon all my sins. Through his righteousness he will cleanse me of the uncleanness of man and the sins of the children of men. Translation by Vermesh. Uh, the word justification here is not our word dikaiosune or tzaddik, uh, since this is Hebrew, tzaddik, but it's uh, mishpati. And the um, there are some interesting phrases here for anyone studying Paul. Uh, we have words of salvation and uh, judgment. We have the word uh, sin, of course, but sin of the of the flesh. That language of flesh is important. Uh, we also have the phrase righteousness of God. And then we have the important point here, the point that um, despite all one's sins, uh, what is really crucial is that God is a God of grace. Grace and mercy brings his, his uh, justification, as this translation has it. Um, the notion is includes pardoning of sin and cleansing from uncleanness, cleansing from sins. Secondly, righteousness is understood as relational in the Old Testament and New Testament. This is a key point for New Perspective people, since the New Perspective, in, in a nutshell, is a social reading of Paul. And so covenant is an important feature of that discussion of the social aspect of uh, Paul's theology here. Uh, now, Elizabeth and Paul Ochtemeyer said uh, all, sometime earlier in 1962 that righteousness is relational and has to do with meeting the demands of a relationship. James Dunn said that this explains why righteousness in 2nd Isaiah, Isaiah 40 and following, and the Psalms involves God's saving act, his redemption and his vindication, even of erring people, and faithfulness. Again, this is all to do with trying to put forward an argument that in Judaism we don't have works righteousness. And thirdly, then, the social aspect uh, of the law um, is in focus. Paul's problem with the law was what it meant for the Christian community. Galatians 2, 1 and following emphasizes the problem of table fellowship between Jews and Gentiles. And Galatians 2.16 speaks of works of the law in reference to his argument, circumcision and food laws that cause Jews to separate from the Gentiles. So uh, he quotes then from the letter of, to Aristius of Josephus, 139 to 142. Quote, in his wisdom, the legislator, that is Moses, surrounded us with unbroken palisades and iron walls to prevent our mixing with any of the other peoples in any matter, being thus kept pure in body and soul, to prevent our being perverted by contact with others or by mixing with bad influences. He hedged us in on all sides with strict observances connected with meat and drink and touch and hearing and sight after the manner of the law. So here's the idea that the law in focus is works of the law understood as these laws that differentiated Jews from Gentiles and these particular practices that are mentioned by Josephus. And then uh, Jewish boasting, discussed in Romans 2, 17 to 23, is really boasting in covenant privilege. And Romans 3, 27 to 31, uh, 
which also talks about boasting, involves Israel's exclusive claim on God as a separate nation. There is uh, Dunn's argument. Paul's problem with the law was its social distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Now, again, some responses to the new perspective views on righteousness and the law. 4QMMT is also a key text for new perspective people, but I think that it actually uh, helps us understand more uh, than what the new perspective suggests about Paul and the law. Here's what it says. Now we have written to you some of the works of the law, those which we determined would be beneficial for you and your people, because we have seen that you possess insight and knowledge of the law. Understand all these things and beseech him to set your counsel straight and so keep you away from evil thoughts and the counsel of Belial. Then you shall rejoice at the end time when you find the essence of our words to be true, and it will be reckoned to you as righteousness, in that you have done what is right and good before him, to your own benefit and to that of Israel. In this famous Qumran text, the phrases works of the law and reckon to you as righteousness can be found. They're highlighted here on the slide. This is the language of Galatians and Romans. Now N.T. Wright says that this text from Qumran offers a parallel to Paul's thought. He says in both the Qumran text and in Paul, Justification is understood as covenantal, therefore it's a social understanding, and secondly, as eschatological. Now, what does he mean by eschatological? What he means is that being reckoned righteous is a declaration by God. It is not an activity of God to bring about salvation. It is not soteriological. N.T. Wright famously has been someone who stuck his neck out against the wisdom of scholarship in the ages to suggest that uh, right, righteousness is a covenantal term, there's the social piece, that uh, has to do not with salvation, uh, but with um, being in the covenant and being having right relationships in the covenant. And then that it has to do with God's declaration that you are in the covenant. There's the eschatological idea uh, that God will one day in the eschaton, at the time of judgment, declare us to be righteous. Um, but it is not a term to be understood soteriologically that we are made righteous in Christ. Paul sees the eschatological event, uh, says Wright, as having arrived in the cross and resurrection of the Messiah and the gift of the eschatological spirit. This event has established the new covenant community, which is now open to all. Well, some of this, of course, is correct, but it's incomplete. And what I would suggest is considering a passage like Isaiah 59, 16 through 21. After all, Paul was much more concerned with interpreting the Old Testament in light of Christ rather than uh, engaging with uh, whatever current theological discussion or understandings might have been present in Judaism. I see him first as an interpreter of scripture and his interpretations are new to him in light of his conversion. Isaiah 59, 16 through 21, has God put on righteousness to work vengeance on sin and secondly, to bring a redeemer for Jacob's transgressions and establish the new covenant. Also, uh, 
the Qumran text we have on this slide for QMMT does not limit works of the law to Jewish identity markers. And thirdly, for QMMT suggests that doing works of the law will lead to being reckoned as righteous by God for both the individual and for Israel. It's both individual and corporate. Note, therefore, that here is also the idea of the extension of a righteous person's merit to others. Yet the teaching about works of the law here is directly contrary to what Paul says in Galatians and in Romans. A second response on this issue of works righteousness uh, in the new perspective is the idea that works righteousness was present in ancient Judaism. Brendan Byrne, a Catholic in Sons of God, Seed of Abraham in 79, uh, looked at this issue and said that Paul also holds both to God's action in Jesus and to the demands of obedience and punishment for transgressions. You can see here somewhat of a Catholic answer to the issue of the 16th century as well, that you have both uh, justification by grace through faith and a demand of obedience and punishment, as the Council of Trent would state. Now, on this issue, though, our, our concern is not the 16th century, but the first century. And in the first century, there's this work for Ezra, a work that Sanders had not considered, uh, partly, it seems, because it went against his argument. In For Ezra, we have the idea that righteousness is attained through doing. And several passages in For Ezra could be looked at, as on the next slide. In For Ezra 8, 31 through 41, we read, for we and our ancestors have passed our lives in ways that bring death. But it is because of us sinners that you are called merciful, the author says to God. Verse 32. For if you have desired to have pity on us, who have no works of righteousness, there's that language again, that phrase, then you will be called merciful. For the righteous who have many works laid up with you shall receive their reward in consequence of their deeds. There's works righteousness. But what are mortals that you are angry with them? Or what is a corruptible race that you are so bitter against it? For in truth, there is no one among those who have been born who have not acted wickedly. Among those who have existed, there is no one who has not done wrong. For in this, O Lord, your righteousness and goodness will be declared when you are merciful to those who have no store of good works. God answered me and said, Some things you have spoken rightly, and it will turn out according to your words. For indeed, I will not concern myself about the fashioning of those who have sinned or about their death, their judgment, or their destruction. But I will rejoice over the creation of the righteous, over their pilgrimage also, and their salvation, and their receiving their reward. As I have spoken, therefore, so shall it be. For just as the farmer sows many seeds in the ground and plants a multitude of seedlings, and yet not all have been sown who will come up in due season, and not all that were planted will take root, so also those who have been sown in the world will not all be saved. This is a hard election theology in For Ezra. Uh, the parallels with Paul are very interesting. Um, there's the idea that salvation does rely on God's mercy because all have sinned and no one can stand before God. But there's also alongside that the idea that the righteous are saved through the, the works that they have done, the many works laid up uh, with God. And so 
we, we have a closer parallel with Paul, but also a slight difference on this idea of works of righteousness. But thirdly, not just one type of Judaism uh, was around in the first century. And what had been argued by Sanders is that all these different passages he looked at argued for his covenantal gnomism. But um, it may well be the case that there is a great variety of views, or at least some variety of views in the first century, as there is today in Christianity on issues of justification and works. And so one question that was has been asked is, was there an apocalyptic version over against a developing rabbinic Judaism in the first century? Some scholars have argued that apocalyptic Judaism believed that the law would disappear in the Messianic age. And so this has raised the question of whether that's true or not. Um, was the law going to be uh, not only present but future? Uh, W.D. Davies argued that the law would be modified in the age to come. But the Talmud uh, tractate Sanhedrin 97a says that the law would not be rejected or modified in the age to come. Frank Thielman has offered a view that the human plight of unrighteousness needs a solution beyond the law and that that is present in at least one stream of Judaism, a discontentment with what Sanders called the uh, Jewish view of covenantal gnomism. Another kind of distinction in Judaism is has been offered in scholarship over the 20th century in particular that there was a difference between Hellenistic Judaism, as represented by Philo the Jew, versus a Palestinian Judaism. Uh, that would be more of what we find in the Pharisees, for example. Is Paul's perspective that of this Hellenistic Judaism, some asked. And some earlier scholars, Vindish, Montefiore, Sheps, uh, argued that it was. Davies argued that there was no distinction between Hellenistic and Palestinian Judaism, and also Martin Hangel.